And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing new analytic uses of master data management in the enterprise. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADV analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle for that feature. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to chat with everyone. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. William is a leading global influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads the McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the incorporated 5,000 list. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Hello, everybody. Um, the FedEx guy just rang my doorbell and my dogs just started barking. So hopefully that's tamed down. That was about 20 seconds ago. You know how it is uh, uh, these days. But anyway, I'm really excited to be bringing you this subject matter about master data management in the enterprise and, and how it can be used maybe differently than how you're using it today. Of course, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about you got your operational MDM and you got analytical MDM, but I think uh, analytical MDM has, has been given the short shrift here and has not really found its way inside of enterprises. And um, I actually spoke to several MDM vendors for this presentation. I asked for case studies and things like this because I wanted to bring you the leading edge and not just what uh, I was experiencing in my practice, but really not a lot of them uh, contributed. I mean, they, they, they gave me case studies and so on. They turned me to uh, some of their clients and so on, and it was great, but uh, that's not the content that I wanted to bring you. I wanted to bring you more about my thoughts about where it could go, where it has gone, uh, not that much, but where it's going to go in the future and where you should start thinking about bringing master data management. Now, let me start off with how I think about master data management is it's not a project in the sense of it has, certainly there's expenses associated to it, but there's no direct revenue associated to MDM. And I want that in regards to a project. I want a finite conclusion and something of high value to the enterprise. Frequently that's money. Now, MDM is great data, uh, although I think it could be doing a lot more within our enterprises. And I think too often we make that, I, I kind of call it the deal with the devil, put that in quotes, where we, we build it for a first use and then we have a hard time <laughs> breaking it off and, and making it useful to uh, other uh, parts of the enterprise. So I wanna talk about that today, just generally kind of where MDM is and where it can be going. I wanna get it to our AI applications because I think that it has tremendous value there. I wanna get it out to the edge in our IoT and edge computing environments. So that's a big part of where we're going today. Okay, this is my obligatory uh, credential slide, I guess. Uh, uh, somebody thought I uh, was in a good list here. Uh, appreciate that. Enterprise data is ready. Now, maybe you've heard me say this before, but enterprise data is ready when it is all of these things. And this is data, not just master data, this is data period. Oftentimes we talk about data in the enterprise, we talk about building it for a given application and so on. I'm particularly keen on those structures though that have a lot of leverage within the enterprise. So I talk a lot about data warehousing and big data hubs that are really data lakes. And I talk about master data management and other forms of data hubs, as opposed to application specific types of structures. And when you put it in these leverageable platforms, it really needs to be all of these things, not just in the, you know, quote unquote data warehouse, because what is a data warehouse, for example, it's a database uh, where you have data 
and hopefully share that data, which really is what makes it a data warehouse. It's not specifically that you call it a data warehouse if it doesn't meet some criteria. So this applies to that, it applies to MDM and what we're talking about here today. We want it in a leverageable platform. If it's not in a scalable platform that's able to go where it needs to go, uh, maybe, you know, maybe it can, but we're not funding it enough. So that's another form of leverage. If it's in an appropriate platform for its profile and usage. And I'm going to make a big, big point today about how MDM beta has its unique characteristics and that we have today anyway, we have platforms out there for different unique characteristics of data within the enterprise. Certainly Data Lake is that, for example, is that another end of the spectrum to master data management data. Data Lake data is unstructured, it's, it's big, it's, it's happening all the time. MDM is a little more static, smaller, more high quality data, all right? So we wouldn't think that we would master master data in a data lake, for example, hopefully, um, though we might want to put it there. High non-functionals, availability, performance, scalability, stability, durability, and it's secure today. So you can't build it without great high non-functionals. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but there are some markers that you want to have for your MBM program. Data is captured at the most granular level, okay? I mean, it might be summarized, sure. Absolutely, because those summaries are what, you know, we can really make some action about, right? So, you know, lifetime purchases, that's a summary. Uh, and that is something that, you know, we can act on. We can classify customers by, for example, and so on. But how do you get there? You get there at by some somewhere, maybe an MDM, maybe not, probably not actually capturing all the transactions. Depends what you mean by transaction. I mean, I have clients that have uh, customers that might do one or two transactions in a lifetime with them because they're really high high fee uh, government types of you know purchases. So that actually might be considered master data. Data is at a data quality standard as defined by data governance. So data governance, I'm really looking at you a lot here today because I think that uh, it's been set aside too much from actual, how shall I say, actual fire, I guess, within the organization and allowed her to roam a little bit more than uh, probably it should. Not everywhere, of course, but I want it to be involved in MDM. I want to, I want to see the manifestation of its efforts at capturing rules and uh, defining stewards and business meaning. I want to see the manifestation of that happen somewhere. And MDM to me is the logical place for that. And here's a Strong quote, I think. Projects are a series of subject area mastery. Yeah. I mean, think about all the projects that you could do within your organization if you had all your subject areas, areas mastered according to these bullets. And let's, well, let's really think about it. Here are some bullets of actual applications, modern applications, things that are happening inside of organizations. Hopefully you can kind of find your way in, in one of these bullets here today. But uh, the list goes on and on, really. And on the right side, I have some enterprise subject areas. Obviously not a finite list. Everyone's going to be different. Customer and product are, are, you know, whatever that means to you, are two of the biggest subject areas, obviously, for master data management. But master data management is an approach to things. It's a, it's a, it's a database that can store all kinds of subject areas. So once you get good at this approach, to things and what you start doing some of what I'm talking about here today, incorporating those analytical attributes, you wanna keep going. And you wanna keep going through all of these enterprise subject areas. Now, I think I have actually just listed uh, good subject areas for master data management and not subject areas like transactions that would probably not fit. Remember, MDM data fits a profile. It's not all your transactions. It's not, we don't suddenly go from a few gigabytes of master data to, oh, let's throw transactions in there and now it's terabytes. Now you have a different platform. We want that platform profile that fits small, high quality data, whatever small means to you. In some organizations, you're gonna have upwards of a terabyte maybe of true master data. Although that seems like a lot. All right, master data is not an option. Yeah, it's not an option. 
which applications are you working on today? Is your organization working on today that don't need master data? I would say virtually none of them, that none I can think of. They all need it. They're going to get it one way or the other. And the quote I tried to, uh, to put together here for you is, you'll need master data, but without a discrete focus on it, you will not get it well. So hopefully you get what I'm trying to say there, which is, yeah, your, your applications are going to drag along some master data management. It's going to get custom from somewhere. They're going to get product from somewhere. Might as well be you. Might as well be great master data. Might as well be data provided as a service from a great place within the organization, an appropriate place, according to the previous slide. Now, you can have an application focus, which is a focus on an application's master data needs first. Now, I'm getting a little bit here into some prioritization of master data effort. Now, I don't know if I've convinced you that you need master data yet or not, but once you get there, you're gonna to need to prioritize your efforts. Usually there is, a going, is going to be a work effort to get to second, third, et cetera, applications. And sometimes, sometimes that means that we stop. We stop at the first application of that master data because we didn't build it with this thought in mind. We didn't build it with, oh, yeah, well, we built customer for CRM, but we didn't build it for supply chain. We didn't build it for fraud detection. We didn't build it for marketing. And so it's kind of hard to, to leverage it at that point. So I want us to get past that. I want us to know that as we're building master data for an application that we're building it for the enterprise. Build to scale. Enterprise focus. This is obviously a preferred approach. Focus is on a subject area first. I like it when a client will say, we have separate budget for master data. Now, it takes some hard work for that client to get to that point. Not everybody's there. And not everybody's there that's actually working on MDM efforts. Okay, you know, we'll work around that. But it's great to have a discrete uh, budget and focus for master data, something that is interesting to all applications. There is a higher chance of creating new organizational possibilities when you do it this way. There is the danger of build it and they will come anytime you're abstracted from applications. There is that danger. So I don't like that danger. I would prefer there to be an application subscriber, subscriber to MDM, not just provider of data, because that doesn't do the application any good to, to be providing data to central MDM. They don't feel good about that. They do feel good if they're getting great master data from you and they don't have to do it themselves. Now, um, there is a there is a, a bit of a lag here. You might be built you might be, have built out a great master data management hub, but there might be six months before the rest of the organization finally decides, okay, I'll get my master data from there, because mindsets take a while to change. Just know if you're in that if you're in that six month period that it will end if you stick to it. Either the, the initial focus needs a secondary focus on the other. Either initial okay, let me say it right. Either initial focus needs a secondary focus on the other. In other words, if you start with an enterprise focus, you have to have an application focus, like I just mentioned. But if you start with an application focus, you have to have that enterprise focus as well, or you won't get it past the first application. So that's the MDM leadership challenge. And hopefully by making you aware of that, it helps you to overcome. So there's my uh, statement again. I guess it's worth saying again, you'll need master data, but without a discrete focus on it, you will not get it well. Do it with data specialists. This is data modeling. This is data integration. This is data quality. These are things that data warehouse professionals, for example, have been doing for quite a while. So they make some natural transitions into MDM, although there is some danger in that. Use a tool. Yeah, use a tool. Now, there are times, there have been times when I've looked at a client situation in a consulting uh, environment, I've said, uh, you're just not ready for MDM yet. Uh, you, all you need to do here is blah, blah, blah. But, but let's, do, let's, let's kick off MDM in, in the correct way because, you know, it's not going to meet your time frame, but let's kick it off in the correct way so that we can transition what you're doing now to MDM and we can ramp that up for all future efforts. There's never a time I, I haven't encountered an enterprise where I'd say, no MDM here. And by the way, if you're, if you're saying MDM, you're, these days you're, you're saying a tool. Now, you might say, well, what if we get the wrong tool? Yeah, you, you, you could be uh, 
you could be, have, have bought yourself a, a problem there if you get the wrong tool for you. There are different kinds of tools. This isn't the tool comparison presentation, but yeah, you'll want to uh, walk that line a little bit. It's operational and it's real time. Yeah, operational, uh, MDM should be operational. MDM should be real time data. It just should be built that way. Let the hub, which is the database, right? Create the analytical and the empowering elements. I like to say empowering, uh, but I'm referring to analytical elements. And so if you need analytical elements in your environment anywhere, why not MDM? So we like to create it in MDM. Of course, I, you know, I encounter a lot of uh, clients that don't have enough analytical attributes anywhere within their organization. Uh, or maybe they have it someplace, but it's in some jailhouse CRM system where it's never going to come out. And, and by the way, the way that the way the analytical attributes were created there, kind of fishy. So, you know, we want to do it right. So if we're doing an MDM project. Uh, we want to do the analytical attributes with that as well. And I'll develop that as we go along here. Make it a discrete project with a lot of touch points with applications, maybe a weekly uh, touch base between the MDM project and the project that's going to be a subscriber. And that weekly becomes practically daily when you get really into it. Focus on the total cost of ownership first for justification. You want to justify MDM as I have dozens of times, I would say, 90% of the time I end up with a, it's a total cost of ownership play. In other words, it's gonna cost you less. You're gonna do this anyway, like I said before, you're gonna do this anyway, but uh, you might as well do it once, do it right, build it to scale, create that data as a service and you de-risk uh, and you de-scope applications by doing that. And you can get things to market a lot quicker, which obviously brings some ROI with it as well. Build it to scale. Doesn't take much longer to consider all known requirements. I want to, I want to interview when I'm building customer, for example, customer MDM, I want to interview all the you know, potential stakeholders of that subject area. The ones I'm building for to be subscribers now and the ones that will be subscribers later, next year, two years from now, three years from now. And I just know, I mean, we just know, right? Think about it. You know, who's going to need this down the line? What are their requirements? Now, you're not going to get them all. You're not going to get them all. You're going to get, you're going to get some, maybe nothing out of some of them, but you've planted the seed, and that's really important. So do what you can to get all known requirements, all known requirements, not the unknown. I'm not saying hold out for months and months and quarters and quarters until you get all requirements forever. By the way, at the end of that cycle, they've changed. The real decision points in MDM are going to come around road mapping around these things. The roadmap is a big decision point. Yeah, who's going to sponsor? And sometimes it just comes down to when you're ready, when, this, when the potential sponsor is ready, uh, uh, reaching back and making the big question. Uh, it's kind of like when you asked uh, people out on dates when you did that or now as you're doing that, right? You, eventually, you have to bring the question out, right? So will you sponsor me? Will you sponsor this project? Will you sponsor a customer? Will you sponsor a product? Will you sponsor a site? Will you sponsor it? So yeah, you want to get there. Um, there's a, there's a, I always say there, there's a, a time frame once you've kind of begun that process to when uh, it's time to move on uh, and find a different potential sponsor if, if somebody's not stepping up. Sometimes you got to have a lot of patience around that too. The subject area, which subject area goes first, which comes next, there's no prescribed, it must be this way, it must customer first or product first. It, it depends on a few different things. And I'm gonna to get to that in a, in a minute. Um, so we'll, I'll help you, I'll help you prioritize, I'll help you roadmap your MDM, help you think about it. Don't forget uh, roadmapping around publishers or workflow, don't forget third-party data, okay. Yeah, third-party data, that's a huge source of master data. Most of that, I mean, most of that is master data. It's just profile information about customers, products, et cetera, et cetera, geographies, currencies, what have you. Uh, I know I'm kind of delving into reference data levels of master data, but you know, that's still master data. So don't forget about that third party data and that it is master data and the MDM hub, the MDM program should encompass most of that data as well. 
the subscribers. These are the important uh, customers, if you will, of the MVM Hub, the AI applications now that you're all building, right? The applications that you're converting from whatever they do now to AI. Yeah, those. Those are subscribers. We're roadmapping around their timelines as well. This is a bit of an art. It's a bit of a science as well. Don't forget about common, common artifacts like the data warehouse, the data lake, and operational hubs and databases and so on. Yeah, the data warehouse needs MDM data. The data lake needs MDM data. Now, very common. It's very common inside of organizations for the data warehouse to already have its own subject areas, right? Uh, to already have built its own quote unquote master data. These are the dimensions of the fact tables, okay? For those of you that follow along to that kind of modeling discussion. Um, and then you bring along MDM. Uh, it is, is not wise at that point to develop it in MDM and then not update the data warehouse. So you have one, right? The data warehouse should become a subscriber to the great MDM data that is one, it's more recent. And two, you've put a lot of, uh, of good emphasis into that data to make it uh, meet all of the seven bullet points that I had before, right? So it's truly master data. And that's much better operationally speaking than a data warehouse is. Communications, road mapping around communications. You're going to be uh, telling people how, what this means to them what this means to them. So you're building, a, you're building cus the customer master data, okay? Let's say, what does this mean to uh, this, that application over there that you know, we hardly ever talk to, but we know they use customer, right? We wanna get them in, into the fold, into the family, if you will. We want to understand what they need uh, from customer, which I already discussed. We want, we want them to understand that we are building this for them as well. Maybe not for tomorrow, but down the road. And there is a time lag there again. So you have to start planting your seeds if you want a real program here. And that's where the MDM value really kicks in when you have a real program to it. And you're road mapping around data governance and stewardship efforts, which is one of the first things that we shore up when we do MDM. We wanna be sure that that's in place to the degree necessary to do all the wonderful things we wanna do inside of MDM. So here's a sample roadmap, all right? Uh, now, how do you pick your targets? I got customer first here, right? So there are three criteria for choosing. What's easy to do? We like easy. We like easy to get the, get the thing going, right? We want to know what is prerequisites for other things. So do customers have to come before product, for example? Do products have to come before suppliers? That may be true in most organizations, for example. So that dictates some things. And finally, the most important thing is business impact. Business impact. Remember the schedule that we looked at before, right? We're looking at everybody's schedules and who needs what, when, and where. And, uh, and we are using that very much. Again, art and science going on here. I like to build out a subject area. And when I see that we are doing this well, I like to jump to the next subject area, maybe ramp up another scrum team and start with that. Um, I would kind of hold your horses on trying to do multiple subject areas uh, from the outset because you want to develop one great way of doing things within the organization and then rinse and repeat. And you can't rinse and repeat if you haven't done it well. And you're gonna learn some lessons in that first one, you are. You're going to learn what works in your environment, what doesn't, how long things take, who's on board, who's not, who needs to be shored up a little bit in that regard and so on. Now you can do this by organizing it around a subject area or you can organize it around a subscriber. I don't like to do it that way, but sometimes I have to. Now what this means is like, let's say you're doing SAP, you're doing MDM for SAP. It needs some things from customer, it needs some things from product, some things from supplier and on and on, right? So you build that stuff all collectively uh, MDM uh, master data that is in the MDM hub and you make it, uh, you make the big old push to uh, SAP. Great. Okay. So you've satisfied, if you will, at least for now, the SAP group, that subscriber. All right, move on to the next one. So that's another way that you could phase this out. And by the way, as I say this, and I show you customer might take 
what am I showing here? Uh, two and a half quarters, all right, of work. That's over half a year, maybe six, seven, eight months, all right? That's, that's about kind of where I want to draw the line. If things take longer than that to get to production, I don't want to I don't want to do, I want to, I want to sharpen the pencil a little bit around that. Maybe customer is too big for you. Too big, a subject area. It doesn't work for you. Maybe you have to divide that up. Maybe there's domestic customer and then international customer and so on. So how long for a subject area? Yeah, that comes into play too. So again, art and science. This slide is a little bit of an interjection on my part because uh, I kind of know what you're thinking at this point. So who does what, right? Okay, this has nothing to do with the attributes we're putting in there, the analytic, analytics, you know, who's subscribing to the data and so on, but it's very important. It's gonna help you get there, right? Remember, we're creating data as a service. Who's going to, who's going to how far does the build team go? And these are the questions you have to ask yourself about how far the core build team for MDM goes. I've done it both ways. And most organizations are not thinking to this level, or maybe there's some assumptions going on. We know about assumptions, right? There may be assumptions going on from the application teams about who's going to do what. And, and by the way, some application teams are thinking, yeah, we're going to do it. And some applications teams are thinking, oh, good, uh, that, that MDM team's going to do it. What is it? Build an SLA for the master data. MBM communication and center of excellence, where's that going to reside? And this is a big one. Who's going to do the integration? Let's say MBM creates this great customer subject area. Who, is it the MBM team or is it the application team for the subscriber? You know, who is going to actually port that data into the subscribing systems? And I'm not here to say there's one right and one wrong way. It depends. Uh, I suppose if I have... Uh, my preference and nobody's stepping up and it's, it, you know, nothing's obvious, uh, I would say the MDM team, but, but everyone's going to be a little different in that regard. That's okay. Figure it out. The hub model and the rule expansion. How far do you go? Remember, I said earlier, you want to get all the known requirements, but that's, I might look at it and say, we got all the known requirements. You might look at it and go, we don't, you have them all yet. So when, when do you draw that line and really start to build? Start to build your model. I go through this a lot in, in, in our implementations. When do we draw the line and stop and move on? Well, you know, hopefully you're, you're targeting something. And so that plays in as well, right? Who's going to map the elements from the hub to the subscriber, as, as I just mentioned? Who's going to customize of elements and data quality rules for the subscriber? And remember, as much as you try to cover all your bases, Initially, every new integration, every new subscriber will have some additional work. You can't just say, you can't just create a project plan for a project that just has like one day, okay, we'll get our master data. Eh, I, nobody's like that. It, it's going to take some time regardless. And hopefully you are including empowering attributes. So there are, core, in my view, there are core attributes and then there are the there are the empowering analytical attributes. For example, last channel used, last visit date, most used channel ID, lifetime value, lifetime transactions, and so on. Satisfaction, like the net promoter score in retail and whatever the equivalent of that is in your industry. Segment, what segment is this customer in? Are they new? Are they gold-plated? Are they the silver? Are they, are we worried about them attriting? Things like that. What categories have they purchased from? What is their propensity to churn? What is their propensity to buy a, another product, product X? Pro, what is their propensity around social? Can they be an asset or a detriment to us there or don't they do that? These are things a lot, some of them are, you know, fueled by third-party data, okay. Um, definitely explore that marketplace, but a lot of them uh, come from within your organization. How do we know the lifetime, for example, the lifetime uh, spend, right? We got we to gotta look at every transaction, okay? So in absence of that, within an environment already, we're going to come up with this list of empowering attributes. And we're going to figure out how we're going to do that within MDM. 
I'm not saying MDM should be storing transaction data. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying MDM should glean or uh, otherwise get all of the analytical value out of transactions. So does that mean you, you feed your transactions to MDM? Yeah, probably, probably, that's okay. That's okay, again, we're not storing it. We're gonna keep a small database, but it's gonna be high quality, high quality stuff like what you're seeing here. In healthcare, we might be talking about con conditions. Um, the table stakes are core. We're, we're all doing that, right? But where you really get to exponential value from your MDM program is in these empowering attributes. And that's what I want you to think about. Now, to be clear, what I'm talking about when it comes to MDM, put it right in there, whoops, one, two, four, um, is there's a hub, it's a database. It's a database. It works with the catalog, it works with the data warehouse, it works with other things. This is just sort of the basic architecture of things, right? There's all these sources, D365 might be, for example, Dynamics 365. This is obviously an Azure looking kind of uh, diagram, but you know, whatever. Uh, the data comes into the hub, it goes out to everywhere that needs it all the data consumers and so on. I, I didn't draw all the arrows, but a lot of the master data management hub data is gonna go right back to the left side, all to all those uh, data sources. They become sources and targets. Maybe they're a source for customer information, but they're a target for product information, for example, very normal. Very good use of uh, master data. So for example, in here, just kind of fill it out. The MVM metadata is published to the data catalog. The data catalog is populated with lineage information from the Azure Data Factory. MDM can leverage the data catalog to display the glossary and lineage information. MDM auto publishes the master data to the dimensional data stores, that's in the data warehouse, and other places. And the, you have the ability to view metadata and the data lineage across the entire data lifecycle. And that's kind of what we're striving for. Now, remember this about MDM data. It's relatively small, it's not big data. It's not big data. If you're thinking it's terabytes and terabytes and, and uh, something like that, you might wanna rethink it because we're gonna, we're gonna put a database in place that's high spec and high quality, but it's not gonna be really geared for that level of, of data. And I'm, I'm only speaking of volume, really it's the criticality of the data that we, we need to talk about. The criticality is high, it's, it's nimble data. It's suitable for the edge where we can only put a limited amount of data. The edge, we used to put no data. We used, then we started putting just some flat file data. And then we started putting database data like MDM data. Well, we're not thinking too much about MDM data on the edge, but I am, and I think you should be too. And now we're thinking not just basic processing at the edge, we're thinking AI at the edge. And that's so empowering for so many of the applications that you're working on. MDM data should be accessible. It should be shareable. It should be high quality. The hub is a touchstone for the organization. When an organization says, well, where's the great customer data at that I can count on? Where's the great product data at that I can count on? I want it to be the MDM hub. That's your touchstone. And it's a touchstone for pushing that data out everywhere and I'm going to put in something here that we're not thinking enough about, and that's to the data lake, to the data lake. Too many of us have data lakes that have kind of hodgepodge master data. We didn't think we needed it there. We thought we would, A, just have all transactional type data in there, all these sensor data, uh, that type of data in there, all the big data, clickstream, whatever, what have you. Or we thought, well, we'll virtualize that to the MDM hub, which yeah, that's, I, I get that. I get that, that might work, but you might physically want to push that data out into the data lake as well. Your data scientists that are working out there will thank you for it. And MDM data eliminates point to point. So very distinguished from big data. And there's, and secondly, I want to say, there's no great wall of China around this data. This data was meant to be used. And so if you have that, you need to get rid of it. Now, what are, you, what are uh, companies out there doing with MDM circa 2021? That was last year, right? Uh, customer deduplication, name, business matching, 
customer profiling for marketing or operations, product catalogs, supply chain management, some level of that, and internal asset management, network management, identity management. That's those sorts of things. These are the big uses for MDM circa 2021. I think it's great. Uh, I think it's, it's foundational. I think these, these are absolutely where MDM knocked it out of the park and continues to knock it out of the park. But we're going to build on that. So just let me build on this a little bit more. Supply chain management. That's a big one for me. Deliveries, shipments, carriers, transport modes, material, sites. Don't those sound like excellent subject areas that if they were mastered, boy, wouldn't supply chain management be a lot easier, be a lot more effective? Wouldn't we save a lot of money? Yeah. Network management, your application, applications, your services, your VMs, your data centers, your routers, your switches, your fabrics, all of these things. If they were managed, your network management would be at another level, all right? Um, but where are we going with this? In the future, we're gonna add those analytical or, or empowering attributes to the model that I showed you before. Calculate those attributes at MDM, that's okay. That's okay. We're gonna add subscribers. Remember, I said at the beginning, MDM data does nothing in and of itself. It has to be used with an application. Now there's a lot of applications on your data lake, right? By definition, a data lake is shared. By definition, a data lake is not sitting there working for one application. It's leverageable. So all of those applications, whatever they may be for you, fraud detection, maybe you're doing some customer management in there, maybe you're monitoring uh, your sensors or something, whatever those applications are, they can have added value if they have MBM data. Edge, same thing, same thing, as I mentioned a little bit about before. So I think just generally MDM needs more attention in the organization. These ideas will begin to grow. These ideas will begin to drive some ROI. Most of this is analytical. Remember, I brought you in today to talk, talk about the value of these analytical attributes. Most of the MDM futures beyond those basics that I talked about is going, going in, into the application, or excuse me, the analytical area. Now, remember, if you're, an, if you're an MDM professional, your customers are those applications and those application budgets are largely fixed and they don't consider MDM today. So we have to make the awareness, create the awareness. And I'm looking at you, data governance, to help create the awareness of these leverageable assets. I hope data governance, you feel good about your MDM program there and your MDM hub. And data governance, if you're sitting there and you're not creating an MDM program, why not? Why not let it, let it grow out of that? Because the goals of data governance and the goals of MDM, they overlap quite a bit. Speaking of overlap, there's this elephant in the room <laughs> of many places. And that elephant looks something like, mm, we have CRM, don't we? Uh, yeah, there's some overlap there. There's some overlap there. Now. Uh, but it's, it's not full overlap, okay? CRM is not meant to be a leverageable data store for master data. It's not meant to be the place where master data uh, gets uh, integrated into applications from, not at all. Um, but there may be some value within CRM inside uh, of your organization to the goals of MDM, which are different. Now, I always want to know uh, about CRM when I'm doing MBM, what does it do? How mature is it? Is it doing analytics? What are the analytical attributes that are stored in CRM? And I learned a lot there. And you know, can they be trusted? And if it's yes and yes, then, well, we just want to push those attributes into MDM. Like I said before, give us your analytical, give us your hard masses, give us your analytical attributes, OK? Uh, wherever they may, may come from, CRM or otherwise. Uh, we're agnostic. We just, want, we just want the gold. We want the good, good data. And if it's already created somewhere, great. But if it isn't created somewhere, MDM certainly can do that. And I do lean that way in environments where I have the choice. These are some sample applications that are improved with MDM. Now, we have, we have different industries here trying to connect with a lot of you specifically here. I won't read all this, but we have some subject areas that are of high importance today to those industries. 
we have some applications and we have some bottom line objectives with MDM. The fourth column goes deeper than the third column here. And I'm gonna now discuss some of those objectives. Some of the objectives that you see here for the various industries, let's discuss them in a little more detail. Customer fraud, let's start there. Now, I'm gonna use this kind of framework to discuss customer fraud. You got some things on the left, but on the right, I'm showing you all of the data, those enterprise data domains that I had up earlier. And I circled a few. I circled the ones that, that you need mastered in order to do great customer fraud detection. All right, and by the way, well, let me just take a quick aside and say, this is how you do your MDM roadmap. You do this for all of the applications that are uh, in focus for the next year or two, or three or four, depends on your organization, how far out ahead you're looking. You do this and that helps you determine what's priority to do inside the enterprise, uh, inside the MDM program. So there you go. I've gone pretty light, I think, on connections here. I don't want to scare anybody, right, by circling everything for customer fraud detection. But truly advanced customer fraud detection gets into more than what I have circled, especially when you get into artificial intelligence, customer fraud detection. Now, I'm saying customer fraud, there are other kinds of fraud. This largely applies there as well, including false invoicing, CEO fraud, business email compromise, all of these are being carried out through social engineering rather than high-tech hacking. And also third-party data um, is very interesting to customer fraud detection. There are other entities out there that focus on risk management. Okay, so most fraud detection today is transaction heavy. It's just looking at the transaction and saying, does this transaction make sense? No. Now that's gonna capture a good amount of customer fraud. And that's why customer fraud is it's at an all-time low because we're doing a great job with this. However, it's still there. And it's when I say it's at an all-time low, I mean on a percentage basis. There's still a lot of dollars, and I won't get into it, but a lot of dollars that are being lost by organizations. It's very worth it for all organizations that deal in this kind of arena to do customer fraud detection. And they all are. It's just, are they doing it well? Are they doing it with artificial intelligence? Are they doing it with master data? Or, do, or is the data kind of suspect? Well, if the data suspect, so will be the fraud detection. We want to sync MDM out to the edge because that's where we can process a lot of what's happening in our environment, right? I talked a little bit before about edge computing. Edge, edge computing uh, is, is highly uh, facilitated by the use of specific types of CPUs, by the way. And there's a whole host of companies that are building these types of CPUs. This is, these are the CPUs you want at the edge. Anyway, customer attributes to include the last in transactions. Give me the, keep those transactions in there. But you say, but you say, there's many transactions per customer. I thought MDM data was one-to-one. -one. Customer has an, a primary address. A customer has uh, a primary contact blah, 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 A, you know, one. No, not, not so. In MDM data, you can have, this, you can do whatever you want, really. And um, again, without getting crazy in terms of volume, but having the last five transactions there, it depends on what your concept is and what a transaction means. But uh, I, I mentioned before, I have a client that usually does one transaction with their customer. So yeah, have that in there. What the heck? Um, but, you know, last whatever it, that's going to feed into the into your algorithms. Average high, low transaction profiles. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice to consider when you're looking at whether something is fraud or not in real time, right? You want to get it right in real time. You can always deny transactions and wait and look at things in batch, right? Uh, but th that's not good. What about the customer state, the state that customer is in? Are they, are they uh, you know, hot and heavy about your company right now? Have they done some uh, some negative uh, social media? Have they uh, been complaining to the call center, et cetera, et cetera? You know, that may factor in. Customer's financial profile, which you may not know. You may not know completely. This is where third-party data might come into play. 
All right. Um, but of course, there's whatever you got as well that might be interesting to MDM. I'm trying to make MDM at the edge facilitate customer fraud detection here. What about real-time recommendations? I guess it's kind of similar, right? We're in fraud detection, we're recommending whether we're taking the transaction or not, but real-time recommendations is more, more positive. I guess we want to get more positive here and talk about you know, what we should be pushing next to our customers out there in real time. We want it to be real-time and relevant. We want to combine customer demographics, the purchase history and the activity and match historical and session data. We want probabilistic models, which aid in understanding in the conversational shopping scenario. Accuracy in the scope increases with data. So the more data you can bring to bear, the more quality data you can bring to bear, the better it should be. Now, when I say the more the merrier here, I don't mean, oh gosh, we've got to bring all the transactions to bear and, and analyze them all in, in real time. That's going to take a while. And you know the customer is going to click away and blah, blah, blah. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you've done your homework. You've done your work in the background. There will come a day. There will come a day. And it's not too far off where all this summary of data that I'm talking about, it won't be necessary because, because the processing will be fast enough to pour through terabytes to petabytes in real time and come up with up to the minute, up to the second, you know, customer profile, <clears throat> recommendations, fraud detection, all this sort of thing. We're not there today, though. We're not quite there, and we, and we can't wait for something like this. This is an absolute necessity for any kind of business to have great real-time recommendations. So when I say accurate, accuracy and scope increases with data, I mean with high-quality data. All right. Here's another area that MDM is going to go into. And again, it's based upon having mastery of certain subject areas, trading partners, creditors, customers, companies. If you have that mastered, you, you're, the application part of this is light. If you have it mastered for, if you have the right subject areas mastered, per my definition earlier, the application component is going to be light. And I know you're thinking, well, no, 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 you're anti money learning is complicated. Yeah, of course, I, I get, I get what you're, where you're going there. But look at the subject areas that I have before you. And what if they were developed to a uh, low granularity, high quality, up to the minute, you know, high quality data there, if that was made available in real time, that would go a long way. I'll just put it that way. Schemes are sophisticated now. There's no more when it comes to, I shouldn't say no more, but there's, there's not a lot of the old school bank robberies, you know, when it comes to financial fraud, you know, where the robber comes in the, at the bank with the bandana over their, their eyeballs with the eye holes cut out and says, stick them up, maybe with the finger in the pocket, you know, something like this, or maybe a real gun, whatever. But there's not a lot of that anymore. It's much more sophisticated. There is smurfing activity now, which is huge. This is splitting large sums of illicit funds to a hidden network of beneficiaries. Can you smoke that out? If you're in the financial industry, can you smoke that out today? Don't you need some data to help with that? So in the company, questions that you might answer if you have great master data. Do you know the owners, company and the partners? Are they in high-risk geographies? You know, if you had that kind of information in your master data, that would factor in. Creditors, are they associated with companies where you have little to no information? Are they in a high-risk geography themselves? These are just some of the questions that would come to bear on an anti-money money laundering application. Now, we're not all doing this but hopefully you can kind of find your way and see how I'm thinking about applications. And finally, I'll talk about supply chain management. So here again, here again, I have a bunch of subject areas, all appropriate for master data in some way, shape or form. So next level supply chain management, what you know, we should be working on can take months, not years, if these subjects are mastered. 
So for stuff like geography, have you developed that? What I, what I hate to see is a uh, lightly developed subject area in master data management. And then each application has to build on top of that. And they, they of course, build it outside of MDM. So nobody else is ever going to get the value of that. And they had to correct a lot of the wrongs that are inside of MDM, some of which the MDM team knows and they just don't have time to deal with, and some of the some of which the MDM team doesn't even know about. And that's kind of a shame uh, when that's the case. That's very inefficient. So again, open communications helps a lot with this stuff, right? So an example, uh, supply chain management breakdown, breakdown is you're distributing network resources to meet the demand. You're doing route planning for time and transport costs, customer management to keep them coming back, risk analysis of potential accidents and extraordinary events, which may factor into the supply chain, right? Maintenance work, renovations and asset purchases, distribution centers and warehouse management for proper allocation of capacity and available space. So you learn from your network as you go. And that's great supply chain management there. It doesn't just optimize what you have, it improves upon what you have. And this is all based on great master data. So I've given you some ideas here today, hopefully, about some analytical uses of master data management in the enterprise. Uh, I've talked about plotting your, your route uh, of master data through the enterprise over time. Uh, the sooner the better that you get started on that. And uh, the, more, the more broad thinking, I guess, that you are when you do that, the better. So where do you look for MDM opportunities? I've given you some examples, but you can look at the products that you make and the services that you offer, the supply chain for those products and services, the business operations, the intelligence used in designing your product and service set. What do they look at? What, what are they using? Is that master data? and the intelligence used in the marketing or approval funnel for your products and services. So the approval funnel as well, what kind of master data might be interesting there? And that brings me to the end of the formal part of the presentation. If you have any questions, I will take them uh, now. Back over to you, Shannon. William, thank you so much. As always, another great presentation. And uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording, along with anything else requested to everybody. So diving into the questions here, William, lots of good ones coming in. You know, for data warehouse and data lakes, do you suggest uh, to use APIs to get MDM data, for example, customer attributes like name, et cetera, or store a copy locally in the warehouse and constantly refresh. Example, what if APIs are down? I still need the customer attributes available, those stale. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Um, I like APIs. I like the use of APIs wherever possible within the organization. I think that's great. But um, you can't, today, you can't overlook the value of physically having the data where it's going to be used. I get the virtualization, I get the APIs and all that, but um, I think if there's going to be high use, you have to make this, this call with every integration, every piece of integration, you have to make this great judgment call. This is why you need some great experience there, uh, some great data architecture there uh, inside of the enterprise, helping with these types of important decisions. Because there's so many different ways to integrate data, so many different ways to skin that cat. But I'm going to say most of the time, I'll tell you what I do is actually physically uh, push the data through data integration uh, to the data warehouse, to the data lake, to really almost everywhere else that, that needs it. And, um, and by the way, APIs are not mutually exclusive with this approach, right? Uh, it's, it's always great to pull that data via an API and actually physically move the data as a result. I love it. So should data uh, harmonization and golden record push back to source system, which is tricky, is a must to have uh, use case and MDM solution? Wow. Um, yeah, we'll get into architecture there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it is tricky, uh, as was mentioned, but um, sometimes the, you know, the, the, the data, the, the hub, the master data hub becomes sort of an information factory, right? It's gonna, that's where we're gonna push data 
churn the data, do whatever we need to do with it. I'm doing one, one uh, you know, implementation right now where the MDM deduplication, the deduplication uh, features within MDM are, that's what's important. And that's, that's what MDM is doing to the data and then pushing it back where it came from. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. If there's value there, if there's priority there to do that, to have that great data there, Absolutely. So the the warehouse, or excuse me, the, the master data hub and all the master data processes kind of become an extension of that of that data set, right? Because it's going to provide a function to the data set. The data is going to go back. It's going to be cleansed. Then it then it can hopefully go on to greater uses. So absolutely. What is the difference uh, between conceptual data model and data uh, domain model? Are they the same? Practically, they are the same. Now, you might find some, uh, you know, purists from Dame or whatever that, that might contradict me on that. But uh, from a, I'm down at the project level, right? We're doing projects, and uh, I'm not just I'm not drawing too fine a line between those things. If somebody gives me a great conceptual data model, what what's in those blocks, uh, those those spokes, I guess, of that model, are subject areas, hopefully. And hopefully they are also subject areas that I can master within MDM and I can do so within that kind of six month window. Again, getting back to what I said before that if it's going to take more than six months to master it, according to my, my definitions, then uh, I believe that you need to break out that subject area. If it's going to be, if I'm going to have a complex web of data stewards for the quote unquote subject area, then you need to break that up. And make it more simple. I'm not saying you have to have one data steward per subject area. That might be stretching it a bit for a lot of organizations. Maybe it's a de small department, uh, okay, but it can't be ten departments, you know, that are going to weigh in on every single decision, right? So if that's the case, you got to break it down even more. So I like a, a good either one conceptual data model or subject area model as a as a, one of the early things we want to do in a in an MDM program, and it shouldn't take all day. You should, you should be able to pound that out in, in half a day. And that's it. Move on. I love it. And I think we have time for at least one more question here. Uh, is it necessary to have subdomains under domains? Aren't domains good enough? Is there a strong rationale to have subdomains? I mean, um, uh, I would, I, getting back to my previous answer, uh, you might find a use for subdomains where the domain is just too big to be actionable. And uh, in that case, you might have subdomains, but really then we're talking that the subdomain in that context is going to be the level that we're actually going to work with inside of a MDM roadmap. And that's what, that's what I care about. That's what we all should care about. That's the actionable part of this. So um, uh, you, now domains and subdomains, that may factor into your data steward strategy, right? because you might have different levels of stewards and you know each organization is going to be a little bit different in that regard. So yeah, I definitely wanna go with it. Make sure I get great data stewardship, make sure I get great data governance, great program management and so on, a program governance, if you will. And that may lead me to using terms like domains and subdomains, but I tend to try to keep it simple, at least at the outset and just say, here's some subject areas, let's work on them. Perfect. And I can slip in one more here. Would you uh, address ESG data management within MDM thoughts with regards to challenges and are having reasonable expectations with respect to establishing the framework versus achieving threshold? What was that first word you said, Shannon? What kind of data? E uh, ESG, so uh, environmental social governance. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it fits the mold. It fits the mold of master data. Uh, absolutely. Um, I haven't had a, a opportunity, I guess, to call data out as such, but uh, I do believe that um, it fits the mold of MDM and it should be treated like MDM. And uh, again, it's kind of a form of reference data, right? We talked a little bit about that as being just a just an easier form of, of a master data management subject or maybe one that we don't have to have a steward for, maybe one that's very, very static. Maybe one that the only update that we do is we put on a, a, a very light workflow panel, I guess, on MDM where that, that data can, can be updated. Again, we're going to keep, we're going to keep all, uh, all history of data 
uh, that ever happened inside of MDM. So uh, that keeps us, you know, moving forward and, and being able to look in the past and so on. I think ESG d d data fits that mold. So yeah. Well, William, again, thank you so much as always for another fantastic presentation. But I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for today. Thanks to all the attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I just uh, love so many familiar faces out there, or familiar names. <laughs> it's been great. You guys are the best. Uh, just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording of this session. So thanks, everybody. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks, William. Thank you.